Hello and welcome to our February case study. It's about optimizing the menstrual cycle in a woman who has painful periods and insulin resistance. So let's jump right in. My name is Dr. Kelly Roof. I'm a naturopathic physician and also a clinical educator here at Precision Analytical. This is my Instagram. I'm mostly posting about hormone replacement therapy these days. Here's our disclaimer. And our objectives. So number one, we're going to do a little overview of primary dysmenorrhea. And remember, dysmenorrhea is the medical term for like cramping during your period. Um, we're going to review a Dutch case study and then talk about further workup and treatment considerations. All right, so dysmenorrhea, menstrual cramps. We've got primary and secondary dysmenorrhea. Primary dysmenorrhea, it occurs in the absence of a disorder that could account for the symptoms. But secondary dysmenorrhea occurs in the presence of a disorder that could account for the symptoms. Um, and we'll see a list of signs and symptoms on, or we'll see a list of things that can contribute to secondary dysmenorrhea on the next slide. But I did wanna point out that primary dysmenorrhea tends to affect young women. You know, it, it tends to not affect older women as much. And it can improve with age and after childbirth. That's the good news. Whereas secondary dysmenorrhea tends to develop later in life. So here are all these causes that I was talking about. You know, endometriosis can contribute to secondary dysmenorrhea. Um, even IUDs, you know, look through this list. Really interesting. IBS, fibroids. So with dysmenorrhea, we, there's a few features that are pretty common with dysmenorrhea. You know, the timing of the pain, usually it can occur one to two days before the onset of menses um, or around when a woman gets her period. It usually doesn't last longer than three days. And the location of the pain, it's like midline, abdominal, suprapubic region, but sometimes it can radiate to the back or to the thighs. And a lot of times women have these other symptoms. They've got nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, headache, and general malaise. So uh, always ask about these other symptoms too. A lot of times they go hand in hand. There's some risk factors for primary dysmenorrhea. Um, age, like we said, it affects younger women. Smoking, higher body mass index, so BMI. Um, they tend to see it in, in women who are attempting over and over to lose weight with some depression, anxiety, you know, emotional issues. And early menarche. So when women get their period for the first time at a younger age, it seems to increase their risk for primary dysmenorrhea. Um, and of course, heavy bleeding, never being pregnant, family history, and regular consumption of caffeinated beverages. Here's a study that just talks about how prostaglandins can be involved with dysmenorrhea, and especially the PGF2A, PGF2. What happens is it causes increased uterine tone and high amplitude contractions. So that's what's causing the menstrual cramps is actually those uterine contractions. And if someone has high amounts of these pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, they might have just worse cramping. All right, let's jump into the case study. So this is a 24-year-old female. She's got regular cycles. She has a significant, in her own words, painful periods and cramping, but she denies heavy bleeding. She's like, I'm not bleeding heavily, just, just got these bad cramps. Uh, moderate to severe fatigue throughout the day. It's worse during her period. And she drinks coffee, two to three cups a day to combat that fatigue. Her pelvic exam was normal. She's considered overweight by her BMI. It's 28.3. Remember, the normal is 18.5 is to 24.9. Her fasting insulin is 16. So that's above range. Remember, we want it below like nine. So if we look at page three of the Dutch Complete, remember with progesterone and estrogen on a female report, in between the two stars, where it's shaded green, that's the luteal range. And this little purple band is the postmenopausal range. So her progesterone is within range. 
and her progesterone serum equivalent, we calculate this, it's 13.1. And usually I like to see at least 12. So her progesterone is within range. It looks like she ovulated. But her estrogen, look how high her estrogen is. All these dials are red. They're pointing above the upper star. So they're high for the luteal range or the luteal phase. And her androgens, we can see over here four of her androgens. And this one, the androsterone, this is an alpha DHA metabolite. And remember, alpha metabolites are more potent androgens. So she's got some signs of higher androgens also. So the most biologically active estrogen is estradiol, and it's high. Um, but, you know, these, these pie chart, this pie chart, the percentages of the phase one metabolites are within range. So that's a good sign. Like overall, where we have the most amount of our phase one metabolites in the most stable 2OH form. That's really good. The 4OH is below 11%. That's good because that's the carcinogenic pathway. And the 16OH, it's within range. The percentage is within range. Remember, 16OH is a proliferative estrogen. So sometimes it can lead to heavy bleeding or increased fibroid growth. Uh, her 16-OH percentage is within range. If you look at the actual dial, though, it's above range. And it's probably because the parent estrogens are above range. So what are contributors to elevated estrogen? We can see here uh, when women are overweight, they tend to have higher estrogen, blood sugar dysregulation, PCOS thyroid issues, alcohol, dysbiosis, there's a whole list here. And if we look closely at her androgens, testosterone is within range for her age, but there's an alpha preference. And you can see here on page two, I cut and pasted this because we have these androgens on page two that are not on page three. So for a female report, always look back to page two. And her alpha metabolites are above range. And remember that alpha metabolites are those more potent, more androgenic, more biologically active at the androgen receptor. So she's got some higher androgens. So we can see this list here, contributors to elevated androgens. And we can see some of the same things that also lead to elevated estrogen, like being overweight, the blood sugar issues, PCOS, you know, alcohol is on here again, dysbiosis. So what do we think might be contributing to her elevated hormones? Well, maybe her higher BMI, her insulin resistance, high inflammation. You know, because I'm, I'm assuming that maybe she's got high inflammation because she is struggling with those menstrual cramps. And remember, those pro-inflammatory prostaglandins can make menstrual cramps worse. And maybe she's got some detox issues. Maybe she's not clearing hormones out well. And these, I circled her associated risk factors for dysmenorrhea. Remember, this is primary dysmenorrhea. And we already saw this slide, but these are what I think could be contributing to, to her risk factors. So she's young. She's got a higher BMI, never been pregnant, never given birth. And she drinks that coffee. Remember, she's drinking coffee every day to improve her fatigue. And if I just wanted to take a quick look at her cortisol, just to show you that, look, it's low. Now, this is her value here. And the, gr the gray shaded region, that's the reference range. So she's definitely low, definitely below range. So she might be really tired because look at she's got low cortisol, even her metabolized cortisol, which tells you total cortisol production from the adrenals is low. All right, so further workup. Um, you know, the further workup kind of depends on past history. Um, so we definitely want to ask a few questions before we do any of, of the work of the workout uh, work up. But we might look into STI testing. Sometimes if women have gonorrhea or chlamydia, it can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, which can lead to some pelvic pain. Um, there's some labs out there that do specialized omega fatty acid panels. That's always interesting to see because we know certain omegas uh, or just certain fatty acids are less inflammatory than others. 
We could do imaging like transvaginal ultrasound to rule out fibroids, you know, all these causes for secondary amenorrhea. And of course, sometimes people do laparoscopy, um, mostly if they really highly suspect endometriosis. These are some things that can support estrogen detox. Remember, she's got high estrogens and those high estrogens, um, you know, it's possible that they're just not being cleared out of the body well. So we can support the body in clearing out the estrogen with things like DIM, I3C, the cruciferous veggies, the carrot family veggies, cooking with more rosemary or taking a rosemary tincture or having rosemary tea, um, turmeric, curcumin, sulforaphane, glucoraphanin. So glucoraphanin actually is what, when you crush like the broccoli sprouts, it turns into sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is what helps support glutathione pathways and supports phase two estrogen detox overall. Calcium deglucarate, that supports phase three, you know, resveratrol, NAC, a lot of these down here support methylation. All right, so considerations for improving insulin resistance. Remember, she's got high insulin, high fasting insulin. It was 16 and we want it below nine. So here's a few things that people have, you know, they use often to improve insulin resistance. And you'll notice that not all of them are supplements. You know, some of them are like stress reduction, really important because remember stress can lead to higher cortisol and we know cortisol leads to, or if it's high, it leads to insulin resistance. Um, sometimes people do intermittent fasting if it's appropriate. For women, intermittent fasting might be best utilized in the follicular phase, but the week before the period, you know, some people just don't do any fasting. Uh, limit snacking, optimizing sleep, that one's really important. Here are some herbal antispasmodics. So these herbs are going to help calm down those uterine contractions. And some of them we've seen before, like cramp bark. And you know, some people will take cramp bark when the pain starts, but some practitioners will actually give the cramp bark all month long. And then when the pain starts, they might increase to a higher acute type dosing. Um, but we can see things like Don Kwai, Yarrow, Blue Cohosh, Mint, Here's a study. This was from 2012. They did 500 milligrams of ginger root powder three times daily, and they started it two days prior to the onset of menses. And they found that it had a statistically significant effect on relieving intensity and duration of pain. Here's another study. This is actually from 2022. And they showed that applying heat to the abdomen, taking a hot shower, Omega-3 supplements, so that's like our EPA, DHA, fish oils, and ginger all helped primary dysmenorrhea. So this is a kind of a cool little table or, gra or yeah, table, I'll call it a table, or visual that I got from a research study back in, um, this is 2018. And they were showing that linoleic acid and gamma linolenic acid, so GLAs, right? We see GLAs in evening primrose oil and borage oil. They contribute to the proper functioning of many tissues of the body because they're precursors of compounds that lead to the generation of anti-inflammatory eicosanoids, such as the series one prostaglandins. And this one, which I'm not going to read this. Uh, but anyways, sometimes people give EPO and GLA in the hopes that it'll help menstrual cramps because of its, it, it, get, it gets pushed mostly into these anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. Here's some naturopathic topical considerations. Sometimes we recommend vinegar packs, and it's basically a 50-50 solution of, so 50% hot water, 50% vinegar, and we soak a towel, wring it out, and apply it to the abdomen. Um, this is a topical essential oil formula by Dr. Jillian Stansbury. And um, I haven't tried this one with any patients or personally, so I'm not sure how it works, but it looks like a, a really nice formula. 
And then of course the good old heat pack. So here's a summary of those treatment considerations. I wanted to put them all together for a young woman who's got these high hormones, insulin resistance, and dysmenorrhea. And a lot of these overall, like not only can help balance out those hormones, but will, will improve inflammation in the body, help lower that insulin resistance. So make the cells more sensitive to insulin. And overall, that all together can hopefully help with that dysmenorrhea. And then on the side, we can do these topical applications when she's got the, the um, dysmenorrhea. And we can even think about these herbal antispasmodics um, and some of these other things too that we talked about just to help get her through that time period and help prevent those painful menses. All right. Thank you. Here are the references. That is it. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for spending some time with us for the February case study.